Welcome to What's the Deal, our investment banking podcast on Making Sense, the hub for J.P. Morgan corporate and investment bank podcasts. In each episode of What's the Deal, we'll explore the trends that are driving deal making and transforming industries today. Hello, listeners. I'm David Rawlings, one of the hosts for our What's the Deal podcast. I am thrilled to be joined by Michael Semblist. Michael is the chief investment officer of the J.P. Morgan Asset and Wealth Management Business, which advises on over $3 trillion of client assets. Also, Michael is one of the most interesting people I know, so I'm super excited to get into this conversation with him about markets, the U.S. economy, emerging risks, and other things he's seeing within his work. Michael, thanks so much for being with us. Good to see you, David. Michael, why don't we just start with broad themes, U.S. economy, maybe then as it relates to markets, and some of the things that are coming up in your research at this point. Well, we're in an interesting place right now because all the coincident data looks pretty good. And a lot of the longer dated leading indicators that look six to nine months out don't look so good. So that's an interesting dichotomy. And a lot of it has to do with changing credit conditions, the lag associated with the rise in interest rates in terms of how it affects the economy and things like that. We published a table recently of some of the longer dated leading indicators we look at, and they all suggest an economic and profits downturn in Q3, Q4 of this year. Not a terrible one, but one that's meaningful. Can you spend a little bit more time on that? Are there particular areas, whether it's you know bifurcated between services and manufacturing or geographically around that? It's pretty much across the board. When you look at whether it's the manufacturing indicators, service sector, labor indicators, credit indicators, profit indicators, they're all suggesting that there's a downturn coming later this year. And you're starting to see it in some of the regional PMI surveys is starting to show up. Again, it's not anything like a major recession, but it does look like a meaningful economic slowdown. Now, there are some other factors moving in the other direction. In the United States, for example, we're about to get a lot of this spending on the energy bill, the infrastructure bill, the semiconductor bill. And so government spending has the potential to offset some of it. That's why we think that the impact is not going to be so terrible. But we're being patient here. The other thing that's really weird about the market right now is that a handful of the large tech stocks are up 60 to 70 percent and the rest of the market's flat. When the market loses its breath like that and you're heading into a period of slower growth, usually it pays to be a little bit patient. And what does that mean when you say a little bit more patient? Does that mean just a little bit more cash and a little bit more defensive? Yes, that's exactly what it means. And even more than in typical periods, you're actually getting paid a reasonable return on your money to be patient now. But we're just emerging from the longest monetary experiment in history, literally going back to the early 1800s, the United States has never had a decade where policy rates were set below the rate of inflation for an entire decade. And we've just had that. Listen, before we continue, can we just spend a minute on you? You've been at the firm for over 30 years, incredibly successful career, but maybe just in your own words, give us a minute or two of some of the highlights and some of the areas that you get most excited about with your current role. It is an exciting job, mostly because around half of what I end up working on, I have no idea three to four months before that, that it's going to happen. I have been working on energy for many years. All of a sudden, you get a $370 billion energy bill that kind of completely changes the energy landscape. And all of a sudden, you have to understand what the moving parts and pieces are. During the last election, I ended up having to spend a ton of time with constitutional experts to understand contingent elections and the 12th Amendment and all sorts of arcane Senate rules as it related to the election. So there's a wide range of topics that I end up having to work on. I inadvertently or without any design, I ended up being one of the firm's unofficial point people on COVID. I assembled a team of mathematical biologists and drug specialists. So the breadth of topics that I end up working on is pretty broad. So what you're saying is you kind of bring this deep research lens with pattern recognition from years of experience, and that combination makes it interesting to do what you do. Yeah. Awesome. Even in the banking crisis that we've just been through, some of those patterns have been seen before, 
And a lot of people were kind of shocked that we had banks in the United States that were undone by their duration decisions as opposed to their credit decisions. But that's not the first time this has happened. Well, just on that, I think it was interesting. Your year ahead piece, I know, highlighted that issue. That was in January. Yeah. But then it sort of slow played in the first quarter until obviously we had the issues with the regional banks. From a bank perspective in the U.S., do you feel like that is now stabilizing? Yeah, kind of. The problem is that the gap between treasury rates and deposit rates is still enormous. There's still room for deposit outflows as depositors wake up and figure out that there's other places they can put their short-term safe harbor money. What's changed is the willingness of the Federal Reserve to lend against the broader set of assets, specifically underwater securities, that they'll lend against at par. So now when depositors flee, they can get liquidity against their securities or loans to finance those outflows. And on top of that, I wouldn't say that I agreed or disagreed with the decision, but the bottom line is the decision to fully reimburse all of the uninsured depositors in one bank means it's going to be very difficult for them not to do it for any other bank. In the past, there have been substantial losses on uninsured depositors in FDIC workouts. They decided not to do that this time. So the combination of more generous Fed lending facilities and the precedent they set by reimbursing all uninsured depositors, regardless of size, has contributed to a calmer situation. Let's keep going on that. It is a different environment. As you said, we come off 10 years of unbelievable stimulus and it's inflationary and it's unclear how sticky that is. You talked about being defensive. What are some of the other things you're thinking about around portfolio construction and just sort of market observations? Well, the other thing that's changing is we just lived through this period of 25 or 30 years of globalization. When I joined JP Morgan in 1987, The T-bill market went out 365 days in countries like Mexico, Brazil. They now have local domestic bond markets that go out 30 years. We've had this incredible deepening of financial markets and globalization as money is moving around the world. But now that's moving in reverse. The U.S.-China tensions, U.S.-Europe tensions over digital service taxes, which are important and don't get as much attention as they should. All of a sudden, whether it's portfolio flows, foreign direct investment, some trading patterns, the the globalization thing is starting to come apart. Now, it's not collapsing, but it's slowing substantially. And a lot of countries or regions have now decided we want to make things ourselves instead of having these global supply chains that we may not be able to rely on. But we've seen this movie before, right? When countries want to make everything for themselves, You have higher nominal GDP growth, but higher inflation and higher interest rates. And if the growth of globalization brought inflation down, it was fantastic for profits. It's very hard to argue that the unwinding of that isn't going to do the reverse. So we're preparing for investment opportunities in the companies and sectors that benefit from all this kind of resource nationalism and national champions. But it means higher interest rates, which does all sorts of different things to your fixed income portfolio. And it means being careful on some of the cross-border investments that you make that can end up getting tied up in certain kinds of geopolitical situations. Understood. You mentioned the energy bill, the infrastructure bill, semiconductors. Around this deglobalization theme, how does that play into your work? And what are some of the things you're focused on there? Well, there's just lots of, I don't want to call it free money, but it's free money, right? We used to see subsidies that were 10 to 20% of the value of something in order to encourage people to transition from one thing to another thing. Now we have these hydrogen subsidies in the United States. The cost of green hydrogen without the subsidy is, let's say, $5 a kilogram. The subsidy is $3 a kilogram. And the competing source of hydrogen through traditional means is a dollar. All of a sudden, you end up with these subsidies that are 60 to 70% of the cost of the industrial good. What it means is that there's enormous amounts of money (laughs) lying on the table for companies that can meet certain production and domestic content requirements to earn a lot of money through public funding. And whether it's semiconductors or energy or carbon capture, renewable energy credits, 
The United States has decided that they are going to use taxpayer funds to accelerate the transition. And in any movement like that, some of the money ends up giving you a huge productivity boost, and some of it just ends up lining people's pockets. And I don't think this is going to be any exception. Well, and it also leads you to this position around the U.S. deficit. How much can you afford, and what does it mean for the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency? Your recent report, I thought, was just fantastic on the dollar. Maybe hit a few highlights for this audience. Yeah, so the reserve currencies take a long time to unravel. It took over 100 years for the British pound to be dislodged. And by the time the U.S. dislodged the British pound, the U.S. economy was something like three to four times the size of the British economy. So the mere fact that in purchasing power terms, China has reached roughly the same size as the U.S. economy, that doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the kind of things that you need for a reserve currency. The dollar still represents an enormous share of foreign exchange transactions, portfolio flows, foreign direct investment. We don't really see that changing very rapidly because we monitor the data. It all comes out quarterly and we don't see a lot of major changes taking place. And China has these massive capital controls. And it's just unclear to me how China is going to move in the direction of establishing a reserve currency with a currency that has so many restrictions associated with it. An economist could ask the legitimate question, which is what would China's economy look like and what would its markets look like if they had an open capital account and all the money that wanted to leave China could leave China. And without that, you're not going to get companies in the US and Europe and Asia and Latin America issuing in renminbi because the first place they would look to tap is the domestic savings in China, which can't get out. So they've got this kind of problem where they're not going to be engendering greater international use of their renminbi until their own domestic savings can be mobilized to invest in them. I'm kind of dubious over the next 10 years that you're going to see any major changes. Every time some little bilateral contract gets signed in renminbi, it kind of makes the front page of the Financial Times People sometimes have a hard time with big numbers. They look at little tiny things and they don't understand how insignificant those things are in the broader picture. And when you're thinking about something like the reserve currency, what's going to matter are the big seismic changes and not the kind of little anecdotal things happening on the wings. The one thing that I thought was so interesting about your piece, I think almost 90% of all currency transactions on one side or the other have the U.S. dollar. But, you know, as a Canadian, I sometimes wonder if there is a diversity that's happened over time where the pound and the euro and the Canada dollar and the Australian dollar, there's a basket of reserve currencies that maybe diversifies away from U.S. only, but it's still hard to imagine a scenario where the U.S. dollar isn't a huge majority of those reserves. Yeah. Where you can see it even more than trade is Something like 80% of global bond issuance, corporate bond issuance is in dollars. And the majority of that is from companies outside the United States. So the global corporate sector has voted that they're going to be issuing in dollars when they don't issue in their own home currency. And in some ways, that's an even more clear, long-term market-oriented decision about the dollar status. It doesn't mean it can never change. But China has a boatload of issues. And then in Europe, you have a monetary union with no fiscal union. And that's also an unstable launch pad to compete against the dollar. The optimist in me would say, when it's time to find a solution at its most difficult point, the U.S. always seems to find a solution. So I hope that happens over time. But I take your point that this is a slow transition and obviously something we'll continue to monitor. Let's just shift for a minute. You write an annual piece, which I think is so fantastic, on energy Maybe just highlight a couple of the real takeaways. What I can tell you is the people that believe that we can see a rapid transition and massive decarbonization of energy use by 2030 are not being realistic. I can also tell you that the skeptics that don't think that anything is happening and that all is lost and that there's no momentum, those people are wrong too. And it's a mixed bag. The electricity sector is being rapidly decarbonized. Lots of wind and solar are added to the grid every year. 
More and more storage is going to be added. The challenge is two things. Number one, electricity is only 20 to 25% of overall energy consumption. So we can decarbonize the entire grid, but if you can't also decarbonize transportation, winter heating, and industrial energy use, there's only so much good you can get. And the second issue is the constraint in the United States anyway, and I think in Canada and Europe as well, is not building wind and solar and hydro. It's connecting them to the grid. And transmission infrastructure has become the defining bottleneck of the renewable transition because people don't want it and they fight tooth and nail to prevent it. When China builds long distance high voltage transmission, they don't have the same kind of community involvement and engagement in the timing of those decisions. And there's acceptance that those projects have to get built and take precedence over any individual objections from individual communities, which is why they historically have been built much more quickly than they are in the West. But now let's look at the other end of the spectrum. Massachusetts has run out of generation capacity. They need more or they're going to face intermittent brownouts. They contracted with Hydro-Quebec for electricity at five cents a kilowatt, which is a kilowatt hour, which is really cheap power, as long as the United States would approve the construction of a high voltage direct current line to get the power from Quebec to Massachusetts. And then New Hampshire blocked it, and then Maine blocked it. 10 years, $250 million lost, and now Massachusetts is saying, well, we'll build some offshore wind instead. So if we can't get these projects done through some kind of eminent domain, the speed of the transition is going to be really impaired. But there's a lot of progress on different kinds of batteries. Electric vehicle sales continue to increase at a pretty remarkable pace. And there's incentives now for carbon sequestration. I've been very skeptical of them, but now it seems like there's a little bit more momentum. So the West is moving in that direction. We'll see how the whole thing balances out because every year China adds more coal than the U.S. and Europe decommission. You have the U.S. and Europe sprinting to a faster decarbonization pace right. at the same time that China, India, and other parts of Southeast Asia are doing something different. If people are interested in the energy topic, the paper we write is a really good place to start because it covers a lot of ground in terms of energy technologies over a lot of different places. Awesome. Well, Michael, listen, as we wrap, I'd love to get your perspective on just a couple of things that you are really optimistic about as we get through the next 12 to 18 months, and maybe one or two things that you have on your radar that you're watching that you're not quite there yet from an opinion point of view, but you're just thinking about. Well, I tell you what, after 2010, And you saw the U.S., Europe, Japan, and the U.K. all go into this emergency policy of negative real rates and left it there on autopilot and then doubled down during COVID. I was low-key terrified that one day when this all got dismantled, that it would be a cataclysm for the markets. Because you're really destroying a generation of investing and underwriting by having people sit down at their computers and say, well, I could buy this risky thing or I could put it into a less risky thing, but the less risky thing pays me zero. I'll just do the risky thing. And you can do that for a year or two years or maybe three. You can't do that for a decade without having hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars invested in crazy stuff that people would not otherwise have bought save for the fact that they're being robbed of their money by financial repression. So I was very nervous that when this all got unwound, it would be an eight on the disaster scale out of 10. And I'm optimistic because when credit to some of the central banks, this looks like a four, right? They've raised rates, fiscal policy is normalizing. And yeah, you had a lot of unprofitable young companies collapse Some of them were trading at 20 times sales are now trading at one time sales. But those were the riskiest parts of the market. They corrected and we had a crypto correction. And The damage is much less pervasive than I had anticipating that it might be. Life goes on is the tagline 
And I'm happy to see that because this was a very risky experiment that they were engaged in. What we're looking at here is, can money solve problems is the next big question. In the past, they have, right? Money thrown at the U.S. interstate highway system created a boom in productivity. Money thrown at the space program ended up trickling over into the private sector and was the underpinnings of the U.S. technology sector. So can the United States make semiconductors to compete with TSMC? Boy, it's going to be a lot more expensive when we start, at least by half, but something may come out of that. We better get a return on $370 billion of the energy bill. <laughs> Let's see what happens when you combine microbiology with large language models. There was, for the first time ever, and this, time, this kind of stuff normally takes years, within 30 days earlier this year, a group at Stanford used a large language model to discover a new pathway for treating liver cancer and the molecule to do it. So all of a sudden, we've been waiting 10 years for CRISPR and gene therapies and cell therapies to finally play a bigger role. So I'm optimistic that we may be on the cusp finally of breakthroughs on some really complex medical issues. So that's something I'm optimistic about and I'm going to be spending an increasing amount of time on. Amazing. Well, Michael, listen, you are always so interesting and I appreciate our time together. Thank you so much for being with me. You're welcome. If you're enjoying this conversation, you can subscribe to What's the Deal, as well as our other podcast to stay on top of the latest industry news and trends. Follow JP Morgan's Making Sense on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. This material was prepared by the Investment Banking Group of JP Morgan Securities, LLC, and not the firm's research department. It is for informational purposes only and is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase, sale, or tender of any financial instrument.